My name is Jim Wrightson. Hello and welcome again. My name is Jim Wrightson. I graduated from Washington University's Graduate Business School in 1978, quite a long time ago, and have spent my entire career in defense aerospace. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Washington University Defense, Aerospace, and National Security Network, better known as DANS. So welcome to you all to this DANS seminar or webinar. I'm excited to welcome our alumni, parents, current students, and friends to today's program, which is Innovation in the DOD, featuring Jake Lactus. Now, before we begin, let me explain the format for today's session. Besides myself, you will only hear today's presenters, which is basically Jake, and John Gannon, who will moderate the Q&A. Today's program is going to last about 45 minutes. We encourage you to participate and interact by introducing yourself in the chat box. Also, please, um, we encourage you to ask questions at any time, and you can do that by typing a question into the Q&A box during the talk. Um, John will see those questions, and following a short presentation by Jake, um, we'll have time for those Q&As, as John, who is another uh, Dan's co-chair, John Gannon, will. Uh, We'll ask uh, Jake some of the questions that you've been asking and some that you've already asked. This webinar is being recorded and we will share it with the Alumni Association YouTube channel and on our website following this event. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jake Lactus. Jake is the University Program Director at Washington University in St. Louis for the National Security Innovation Network, NSIN. That's a DOD program office creating new opportunities for, in, uh, uh, for innovators between defense, venture, and academia. Jake attended St. Louis University here in St. Louis, where he earned both bachelor's and master's degree in biomedical engineering. And Jake's also been very active in, the, in St. Louis innovation. He previously co-founded a nonprofit medical technology incubator to support early stage idea generation and business development. And he launched a defense startup where he developed and patented next generation nanomaterials for rocket propulsion systems. I can't imagine a better speaker to talk to us about this today. So please help me welcome Jake. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for the introduction. And, uh, and thanks to Dan for giving me the opportunity. Um, to Jim and John and Suzanne for, for having me and, and for being great partners. Um, I'm excited to talk to you guys about all things kind of innovation and in the national security and, and defense space, uh, and also all the other great things going on in St. Louis and in different sectors. Uh, I think there's just so much happening right now in the area that's bringing a feeling of, of energy to the region, uh, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where it takes us. Uh, as Jim kind of mentioned, uh, I'm with the DOD's National Security Innovation Network. Uh, just, just a little background on me. I've been in, in St. Louis for 10 years. Uh, I went to St. Louis University for, for undergrad and grad school, and so I expect about half the WashU folks to, to tune out now. Uh, but I ran a couple of startups. Uh, we started with a bio, biomedical incubator uh, and then quickly transitioned to a, a nanotechnology startup funded by the Air Force um, to produce propellants for space launch. And uh, it was interesting because, you know, we had a lot of issues on, on that side of the equation. Uh, in engaging with the government where, you know, we definitely became closely acquainted with some of the hurdles that uh, a small business faces in working with the government. Uh, you know, historically, the government hasn't been the partner it seeks to be for small businesses. Uh, it takes time. It takes, it takes patience. It can be complicated. Uh, many times it isn't trusted by, by the venture capital community. Uh, and those are really non-starters for, for an early stage venture. Um, just a personal story was when we were with Nanometallics, um, we, we filed a patent um, and there was a, blank, a blanket secrecy order that was actually placed by the Air Force on this technology uh, that removed communication with our entire commercial market by law. Um, so we did appeal it um, and came out the other side, but you know, it took nine months, which you know, in startup terms, that, that might as well be nine years. Um, so it's super intriguing to me to be on the other side, the flip side of that coin with the government um, and with this amazing group Ensign. Uh, that helps companies navigate the bureaucracy and succeed um, and all, 
ultimately offer new capabilities for our country. Um, so, so I want to cover, cover a couple of main items, uh, just what Ensign is and how we operate, uh, and then specifically what we're doing here in the Wash U and in the greater St. Louis ecosystem, uh, and also a little bit on how alumni can engage. Uh, so Ensign is a congressionally funded DOD program office under the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Uh, and our mission is fundamentally to solve the department's most challenging problems, but to do it in a way that's much different than the conventional. Um, you know, normally the DOD will identify a requirement, they will put out a request for solutions, and then they'll implement complicated contracts with a familiar set of vendors. And Ensign really seeks to open the aperture to new types of problem solvers, like uh, startup ventures and university-driven problem solving uh, to enhance the talent uh, and the pace that's applied to, to new defense solutions. Um, so kind of first though, I think it's, it's important to contextualize this need a little bit uh, from a, a broad perspective. I think long story short, a number of years ago, the department decided that we were falling behind uh, and we had a need to, to utilize academia and the private sector to a greater degree to help us keep pace. Uh, and I think you know, the bottom line is that there are a few ways to go about doing this uh, and that are by a few different government offices. But our foundational belief is that people uh, are the most valuable resource. So our preferred method of innovation is actually by developing robust networks of human capital in the nation's most exciting innovation areas, which by the way is why St. Louis was chosen, uh, and offering them tools to quickly engage, uh, succeed, and put a product in play, uh, and trying to stay away from those, those science, science projects or thought experiments, but actually build things uh, that are attached to a customer need uh, and that will be deployed and, and used by warfighters. Um, so, you know, broadly, I think this effort in the department is so important uh, just because the current method of solving problems leaves us orders of magnitude slower at fielding solutions than our adversaries. Uh, they don't have the same complicated bureaucracy to work through, um, and so they encounter less barriers. And so we aim to change how uh, this is done in the United States so that we can fundamentally uh, keep pace and, and stay ahead. Um, so, so a little bit deeper uh, and a little more detail on how Ensign is structured. Uh, so I'm part of what we call our region, regional network team. Uh, so it's myself and others stationed at, at various innovation hubs around the country. Uh, and our job really, uh, really is to provide demand signal from DOD customers about what they need. Um, and also to report and understand the problem solving capacity in our respective ecosystems. Um, in the academic and startup environment so that we can uh, pair those things together through bespoke programming. Um, our, our innovation programming covers the full perspective, uh, the full spectrum of work inside the university setting, uh, focusing on offering opportunities for students to engage in the national security space, uh, from research projects to consulting roles and hiring opportunities. Um, and I think a big one too is offering tools for, for tech transfer at the university. Uh, and giving WashU, for example, access to customers in the government to help develop their products. Uh, and then ultimately offering, uh, offering startups in the Midwest, you know, contract vehicles and pitch competitions and anchor customers and access to venture money uh, and just a multitude of ways to, to grow their business. Uh, so that, that's how en Ensign is sort of structured operationally. Uh, I think for St. Louis in particular, we're um, at an inflection point in this region that is, is super exciting and has been really starting to grow over the past five, 10 years. Uh, I think everyone's, you know, everyone's aware of the excitement around the new NGA campus and the budding geospatial economy. Uh, and Ensign is a key piece in the development of this economy uh, and, in, and with the community, community's engagement with NGA. Um, Ensign really acts as uh, important connective tissue here between two communities who typically don't interact that much. Um, and I think one of the biggest ways is, is helping NGA's effort to, uh, to start doing work in the unclassified space, which is generally um, uncomfortable and atypical in the intelligence community in particular. Um, but I think it's necessary to, to take full advantage of what the private sector has to offer. Um, I was actually talking with former director Cardillo last night, um, and he was mentioning that up to 40% of the new facility uh, here in St. Louis will be available for work on the unclassified side, which is un unprecedented in, in, the, uh, in the intelligence community. So uh, it's gonna be pretty incredible. Uh, we also have, you know, as of yesterday, just announced um, the new Moonshot Labs collaboration between uh, NGA and T-Rex. Uh, and so this mechanism will function uh, as a way for NGA to 
participate with the private sector um, in developing key software capabilities. Uh, and then it'll help them you know, adopt and deploy them downrange. Uh, and so really uh, just in the conversation for NGA, I think we wanna help develop the whole continuum, the whole continuum. So the pipeline of talent for NGA uh, to get people excited and interested in the mission, uh, to use those university-based innovation programs to drive solutions and awareness in the community. Uh, and then also uh, to help recruit and maintain companies here in St. Louis uh, to kind of put down roots here and use NGA as that anchor customer to help their company um, uh, become successful and ultimately make uh, St. Louis a, a national hub and, and a center of excellence for, for location science. Um, so beyond geospatial, uh, we're supporting uh, the development of other technologies. So critical technologies in the healthcare space, um, WashU in the area at large, of course, has, has immense strengths in developing these products. Um, so we implemented a contract uh, at WashU to produce spinouts that are focused on, um, on producing companies that can serve the government and commercial markets. Um, so we, we have five focus areas here. Um, they are AI, quantum, uh, 5G, space vehicles, and biotechnology. And of course, the one I anticipate WashU taking uh, the greatest advantage of is, is biotechnology, but uh, we do have technologies in those other spaces too. So uh, I'm excited to see how that program uh, develops. And then as we spin out companies, they'll be able to take advantage of the subject matter experts, the investors, uh, and the programming available in our St. Louis ecosystem to help, to help drive their growth alongside uh, their development within the government pathways. Uh, just a few more miscellaneous things uh, that we've kind of been up to in the area. Uh, certainly a big thing for us is pushing hiring opportunities for DOD groups, uh, which are always open, not just to WashU students, uh, but alumni as well. Um, we have WashU faculty involved in accelerating government lab technology. Uh, we're getting hundreds of small companies on, on government contract, um, performing community hackathons for Air Mobility Command here across the river um, and for NGA. Uh, we had students working at both Scott Air Force Base and NGA over this past summer. Uh, you know, and Scott Air Force Base has, has a similar nature to NGA where airmen aren't used to coming across the river, let alone you know, working with folks in the private sector. Uh, we had an awesome project this summer with the 375th Aeromedical Evac Training Squadron, where uh, a team of WashU and SLU engineers developed uh, a harness and a regulator for, uh, for their severely outdated uh, emergency oxygen system, which uh, is, is now being developed and funded within the Air Force for adoption. Uh, so it's so cool to see you know, even a university-based based group uh, work on a project that's uh, ultimately going to be transitioned and deployed for, for airmen. Um, and the airmen, honestly, they loved it. Um, they loved interacting with the students. Uh, the students had an incredible, incredible experience uh, in an environment that they, that they likely would have never been uh, exposed to otherwise. So that's really what it's about is kind of helping these disparate communities collide um, and using the talent within, within academia and venture to, to you know, produce new solutions. Um, I, think, I think an important note um, is, you know, innovation has really become quite a buzzword. Um, and so, you know, Ensign's committed to not getting caught up in sort of innovation metrics or talking about, you know, meaningless quantifications of success and just saying, saying that we're innovating. Um, the way that Ensign connects to actual customer needs and, and transition pathways increases the chance uh, that those technologies will actually be adopted and deployed downrange. Uh, and in fact, over the last couple of years, our acceleration programs, uh, companies coming out of them have raised over $80 million in government contracts and over 60 million in private investment. So it, it shows um, one, the magnitude of their success, um, but two, the combination of uh, federal and private dollars that are supporting these companies. And uh, that composes about 200 uh, dual use ventures that we've spun out over the last couple of years. Um, and th that's actually not even, not even counting the, the countless solutions to warfighters through uh, through the programming that I described in the university setting as well. Uh, you know, so I think, I think broadly success for us means, uh, it means building new solutions for, for our DOD partners and warfighters, uh, and also growing the St. Louis ecosystem by, by just offering it tools that we didn't have to offer before. Uh, the end state, I think for me, is seen in really uh, two different ways. So the department will view St. Louis uh, as a hub for, for solving problems in, in a variety of ways. Um, whether it's within the universities and, and sm small businesses. Um, 
you know, and St. Louis then will grow and attract talent and jobs in the sector that it hasn't in the way before. And this can be uh, an important cog in, uh, in building up the St. Louis ecosystem. Um, so that's all I got. Thank you guys so much uh, for tuning in. I'm, I'm more than happy to engage. Um, I think my email will be listed. So, so please uh, shoot me an email and I'm always, always happy to talk. So thank you guys so much. Hi, Jay. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Can you all hear yes, me? Sir. Yep. Oh, great. Uh, this is uh, John Gannon speaking. I'm going to, going to uh, uh, throw some questions at you. And, and one, uh, I, th I think some of our uh, listeners, who, who, by the way, uh, clearly appreciate uh, that you would uh, give us so much time and, and uh, take such and, and so patiently explain uh, what Ensign's all about uh, and, and how, it, how it actually works. Um, the question is about uh, uh, about what, what a person would have to do to sort of emulate your experience and, and you know what, what kind of educational background. Clear that you were a biomedical engineer by, by academic training, but that doesn't explain how you get to where you are uh, if you uh, uh, had, had or involved in a, net, in a network that's creating pathways of, you know, across defense, uh, uh, academia, and then venture. Um, so what, what do you recommend to those uh, that folks who are listening who uh, are fascinated by what you're doing and how would they be able to uh, get into a similar career? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately, of course, my path was, you know, started, uh, started in biomedical engineering, but became convoluted from there as we engaged aerospace and defense, national security, like you mentioned. Um, so I think, you know, foundationally, obviously, you know, you have to understand what it is that you want to do. But I think one thing that's really interesting about the national security space is that is the true breadth of work to be done and the, and the mechanisms by which you can engage. You know, I think traditionally engineering backgrounds are what folks tend to think about uh, right away, you know, and that can definitely put you in an interesting career trajectory uh, and working on some of the most interesting uh, and emerging national security technology. Um, but there are actually so many skill sets that can provide value from, you know, data analytics or policy and imaging science and, and more. Um, so I would say, I mean, there, there are hardly any um, particular skill set, uh, you know, requirements that are actually needed if you're really intent on participating in the space uh, as far as majors go and things. And, and does, uh, do you look this at this as a career or is it like an interlude, uh, a, 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 you know, an exciting interlude in a career that may have some other objectives uh, down the road? Is, is it actually a, a, a kind of a sustainable career path? Yeah, I, I think the opportunities in national security certainly are. I would use, uh, you know, um, a more technical pathway being in government labs. And, you know, let's say you were to get a job somewhere at a, at a, a, a say, say it's Naval Surface Warfare Center, uh, and you're working on technology for national security. It actually opens up your career to the, the nationwide network of national labs, um, where you can jump from, from DOD to, to DOE and other government positions or, or within the DOD. And then many times, uh, many times the people do use it as an interlude where they'll work for a while in, in government and then they'll use the skills they've developed to transition to private sector um, where you know, maybe they transition to a startup where they're working on uh, technology that can be used by the government or, or maybe not at all. Um, I think the possibilities are truly endless, but I think it's a relatively untapped resource as far as um, career opportunities. But um, just the, the subject matter that you'll be working on uh, in some of, these, some of these government opportunities is truly incredible. You, 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 you mentioned uh, NGA and, and the, new, the new campus in, in, in St. Louis and the opportunities that, that it is it, it put, uh, presenting for NSYN. We had a question uh, uh, from uh, an uh, imagery scientist, which I know, I, I know imagery scientists are in high demand across uh, uh, the defense industry. But what opportunities are there that you see for imagery scientists in the, in the, in the way you're seeing defense yeah. priority? You know? Yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, you mentioned NGA, but actually, and so before my, uh, you know, before my time in national security, I would have thought of imaging science. The first thing I would have thought of would have been the medical space. 
um, which I think actually within the DOD for medical applications, there are, um, there are pathways for developing imaging science technologies. Um, here in St. Louis, of course, the most uh, interesting thing with imaging science is taking you know, the skill sets and research that's being performed and help, uh, help accomplish the NGA mission. But um, imaging science, I think, is one of those kind of platform technologies where there wouldn't just be one service that would be interested in a, in a technology in that, in that space, but many. It could be NGA, could be Defense Health Agency, it could be uh, the Air Force even. What about the, uh, you mentioned in passing, uh, well, not in passing, but you did mention the aerospace industry. Uh, what, what kind of opportunities exist for uh, collaboration, uh, for ensign collaboration across the aerospace industry? Yeah, uh, even I would say, I mean, even so much more than, than imaging science, there's so much uh, going on in, in aerospace, in, in the university setting uh, and outside, outside this region. Um, we have so many ensign companies that are aerospace startups doing um, training, uh, training and maintenance and uh, advanced materials. Talk about uh, artificial reality, virtual reality platforms for um, maintenance and things, all the way to you know the drone space, which is talked about a lot these days. So the overlap is immense, uh, and I would say it's even more so amplified because uh, one of the strongest partners we have among among the services is the Air Force. Um, they're some of the most forward leaning in terms of innovation programming. So sometimes it's easier to get linked in those early stages of development uh, in the aerospace field. Uh, we have a, a question too about uh, uh, DIA. Uh, do you have any uh, outreach to DIA and, and uh, its programs and uh, with what you're doing? Uh, personally, I actually do not. Um, we have some uh, some sort of secondary connections through Ensign, um, and I know we collaborate on projects that we do uh, for the intelligence community. There will be communication, um, you know, if we do something for NGA or if we have something come through for, for InQtel, there can be conversations uh, with that, but actually more of a superficial interaction with DIA than a deep, than a deep customer engagement. Right. Among the intelligence communities uh, and agencies that I'm familiar with, I, I would expect NGA would be most eager to, to, to work with you. Uh, I, but I suspect that some of the other agencies, because you, you actually deal with defense priorities, which must be of interest to foreign governments, um, are you finding uh, there's certain reluctance on the part of some of the uh, other agencies to work in a, in a venture environment? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think um, this is a new corner that we're turning and interacting with, um, you know, in the unclassified space with new partners. Um, and so for, for enterprises that have a, like large institutional inertia, it actually takes a long time to introduce new concepts about how this can be done safely, um, you know, working in the unclassified space and with new uh, non-traditional partners doesn't mean throwing away uh, everything that we need to be concerned about with national security. So I think it's a fine balance of making sure that um, we can bring in these new tools that are going to help us produce effective uh, effective tools for our warfighters without compromising the integrity of, of national security. It, uh, does DOD have a policy with regard to foreign uh, government interest in in, in collaboration with Ensign? I mean, it, it, you, could, you could make an argument that uh, some foreign governments actually could enhance uh, the, the research uh, capabilities of, of, of what, you, what you're doing. In fact, I think most American universities would probably make that argument. But you, 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 I think you know well that we're in an environment where, where particularly uh, coming from Congress, there's a great deal of sensitivity about the activities of uh, we, we have about 350,000 uh, Chinese students, uh, many at Washington University, by the way, and I suspect many at the St. Louis University. So, so the uh, uh, DOD and other, but not just DOD, it really is uh, in our Congress, a lot of sensitivity about leakage of, of uh, sensitive uh, uh, technologies to foreign governments, particularly to China, even in, an, in the classified environment. So. Uh, do you have any help me with that one? How, how do you deal sure. with it? And how do you think the, the government should be dealing with it? Yeah, sure. I, I, it's a great question. It's one we get a lot to by 
both university partners and our customers, uh, the four nationals question is always a thing. Um, and Ensign certainly makes a point to be uh, as inclusive as possible with as many of our programs as we can. So the way that we do that most effectively is um, we do allow, allow foreign, uh, foreign nationals to participate in our programs that exist in the university setting. Um, and even in some of our, our programs where we're developing new technologies, we can have um, PIs who are foreign nationals. Uh, there are restrictions when you get to the point of a developed company um, and how much, uh, how much of the company is domestically owned versus owned by, by, um, by a foreign entity. And that's just for, you know, those are more contracting uh, sort of regulations and not, not regulations implemented by Ensign. But I would say for, for most of our programs offered in the academic and early stage setting, we really make a point to, um, you know, because so much of the talent, for example, at McKelvey Engineering School is for nationals. And if they can contribute and want to contribute to the national security mission, there's no reason that we should include them, uh, disclude them, I should say, uh, until it becomes, you know, there is, you know, obviously at some point it will become uh, a national security thing, but um, we try to be as, as inclusive as possible for sure. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, you talked about the way you're structured and obviously you're, you're a regional uh, uh, structure in this, but, but when you uh, look at the way venture capital works, um, uh, there's, there's gotta be a national kind of uh, perspective on, on opportunities. Uh, do you do you interact with other regions in a in a significant and lively way that uh, that that would enhance the the, the potential for uh, greater collaboration uh, in a broader uh, uh, geographical area? Yes, definitely. Um, and I think too the important thing or one important thing is that um, venture capitalists, like I mentioned, can be tentative uh, or hesitant when investing in. A company that's also funded by the government for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think it's only now emerging to be uh, a more trusted partner. And so it's important for us to use the strength of our regional network team, which, you know, we have folks stationed at Berkeley uh, and ASU um, and all, all around the country. Um, you know, it's important for us to leverage the venture capital groups that are actually comfortable investing in some of these defense technologies. Um, just to have a bigger pool for these uh, for these new companies to team up with. Um, so certainly certainly tapping into the strengths strengths of the regional team is key in how Ensign operates and how we provide support to our companies that come through our programs. Okay, thanks. I have a, a question, uh, uh, Jake. Uh, it, it it reads, "Quote, Jake. One thing that has concerned me is making a small business pitch to the DoD while still maintaining my current career." In other words, if the pitch is unsuccessful, I would still want my old job to, to fall back on. Is the DOD and or uh, Ensign cognizant of folks in this situation? If so, how do they help facilitate folks make a pitch without having to abandon a job? Yeah, I, so I think I, I understand the situation. And is it, John, do you think it's a pitch for a job or a pitch for a company? Uh, I have a sector, a company, but I, uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a lot of folks, um, so this is, this is something that Ensign does usually help with. Um, we can provide sort of a linkage and a conduit for folks to have conversations with, um, with end users in the DOD to kind of explore, uh, the things that they do care about. Um, so exploratory conversations happen all the time. And I don't think it would be something that would, you know, usurp him from his previous, previous gig. Okay. Uh, in terms of the unclassified uh, positions you mentioned at NGA, uh, what, what opportunities, actual concrete opportunities might that represent? For working with the NGA? Yes. Yeah, so, so certainly across the board. So um, within the university, we, we have um, programs that are um, courses. So we'll have Hacking for Defense this spring, which is an interdisciplinary course uh, that'll be tied to NGA problems. Um, we have our fellowship, uh, paid fellowship over the summer, where students actually embed with DOD commands. Um, we have, I mentioned uh, Defense Innovation Accelerator earlier, where we've had faculty and MBA students engage with 
technology that's on, on the shelves and uh, performing the in initial stages of product market fit um, and, and the early stages of how that product would fit also in the commercial market. Um, so those are, those are opportunities within, within the university. Um, also mentioned tech transfer. So things that actually exist right now on the IP shelves at WashU um, that we're interested in transferring to, uh, to the end benefit of either NGA or, or another customer. Um, and then importantly, um, helping NGA set up um, early stage, you know, small, small business topics uh, through the SBIR program. Um, and so that we can get St. Louis companies, but companies from elsewhere too, uh, on board with, with NGA customer discovery and, and in the pipeline to uh, help develop their product and ultimately have it um, acquired and deployed. So uh, I think the answer to the question is very broad, but all sorts of programs for teaming um, within the university and outside the university alike. Okay. Could you, uh, I mean, uh, in the venture capital world, I mean, there are successes and failures and there, there is, there is about risk. Uh, and, and I, and obviously, uh, uh, you had a biomedical engineering background, but you also had to be willing to jump into, uh, in the, in the startups that you're involved with, uh, you, uh, you took on the risk and you either win or lose. Can you talk? Can you talk about particular successes that Ensign has had and maybe what lessons are learned about, about, about how uh, the, the government can be more successful at actually promoting in, innovation um, in, in, in the way Ensign wants to do it? Sure, Are yeah. Um, we, we talk about a couple of flagship sort of successes a few times. Um, we had a, a company called, or a group with, called Capella Space that came out of the Stanford Hacking for Defense program that actually um, is a, a very large, heavily funded and successful uh, space launch company now. Um, and, you know, it's just super interesting that we can have a something that starts so early in the Ensign pipeline um, and offer resources for them to grow uh, and develop. Uh, another company that came straight out of an accelerator that we ran, we ran is Vita Inclinata, um, which is, has found tremendous success um, within the government. And so I think the point is just that, you know, the Ensign kind of experience, especially for folks who stay in for, for repeat experiences can grow and develop within that network and take advantage of the resources that we have to offer um, and, and pursue opportunities that are interesting to them. Uh, and Ensign's, you know, and one of Ensign's key strengths is really being in touch with the, the needs of the DOD customers, which has historically been one of the most sort of mystical things um, and hard, hard to decipher for people in the private sector. So that's where we come in and we can help, um, help people kind of decode what DO, different DOD groups want for these startups uh, and individuals. When you uh, sir, end up with a, a proposal that you're excited about, uh, uh, what, are, what, are, what are the factors that, that make you believe that this, this has a real potential success as opposed, which is minimizing the risk and maximizing the opportunity for, uh, you know, for a, 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 a win. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, certainly very multivariate. I think when stuff is brought to us, we, we try to decide um, where is the idea? Um, how far along is it? How, how ready is it? Uh, and what are the steps that it needs to get to deployment? And that helps us really decide what program to put it into. Um, we look at the team uh, and who's on the team and how we can actually help add team members through our network. And then we look at the connection between the piece of technology and the customer and decide how strongly they overlap and how, you know, if this really, um, you know, blows a customer away and they're extremely interested in it and there's money allocated by that DOD customer, it's a really good signal to us to say, hey, you should keep working on this. Ensign should put resources towards it because this is a customer who needs something for the warfighter and is willing to pay for it um, so that's, I think that's really the, the hard hitting one there. Okay. Uh, you know, on the, on the I issue of risk, uh, uh, you, you were involved in a couple of startups. I, I was in one myself and my, my re uh, recollection is you work like a dog in a startup company, you work extremely hard. And when you win, nothing beats the feeling of winning. When you lose after, uh, uh, after working so hard, it can be, a uh, at least temporarily devastating. I mean, uh, to, to, so to, to, what kind of personal qualities do you have to have to live in the venture um, environment? And, and by the way, I would assume that in the, in the job you now have, 
you're dealing with somebody else's money. So it isn't, it isn't a, you know, the, an investment that you, that you are personally tied up in. So it's, it's, it's different. Uh, but uh, you, you're still involved in the, in the, the risk business. And, and uh, so what kind of, uh, if you were to talk, some of the folks I think who are listening to you now, they're, they're wondering, would I, have the, would I have the qualities that would succeed in this environment? Um, what, what would you say about what qualities are desirable for someone working in this environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, frankly, I, I think the most important quality is actually self-awareness. Um, you have to be aware of your own particular risk profile um, and not, I don't think everybody is actually built to go out and start a three, per, do a three person startup uh, and try to develop technology, get a company or get an investor and get a customer on board. Some people are. Um, for those who are slightly less, there are startups that are more well-developed and on the track to success. And that can be sort of a, a, a mid-tier option, but I think it really starts with um, with being self-aware. And then, you know, secondary to that, it's certainly a resilience thing. You mentioned a lot of good points about, um, you know, sort of the ups and downs and, and being in a startup is certainly a roller coaster. And, um, you know, but actually, you know, our goal with Ensign is, is to sort of smooth that out a little bit and offer, offer a partner that's um, fundamentally different from the way that private investors support companies with non-dilutive capital uh, and patience on deadlines and developing technologies. And so um, I think there's a lot to be offered by the government side to sort of mitigate those ups and downs of a startup. N nothing will ever take it away entirely, of course. Um, it's just a difficult environment. You have to be uh, honest with yourself on how much you can tolerate um, and what you're willing to go through um, and, and how important the technology is to you. I think the first thing is that, you know, it definitely can't just be a job to you. A startup can't, you have to really deeply care um, you have to care a lot about it um, in order to get up every day and keep uh, getting after it. Okay. Uh, one of our questioners uh, had a question I know that you would uh, you would certainly have an answer for, and that, that has to do with the impact of, uh, of uh, national elections, and I, I assume he means a presidential election, which, you, which is 12 days away for us. What impact does that have on the defense? Um, uh, it's probably more a question about the defense industry as opposed to uh, the defense agencies of, of, of government. But what what, uh, what is your answer to that? And, th and by the way, there probably would be many answers depending on who you ask the question to, but uh, you're the authority in the room right now. So. Sure, sure. Yeah, this is, a, this is a very interesting question. I think um, there will certainly be um, obvious things that will change, like the picture of, you know, big defense spending and um, the geopolitical fallout in a variety of ways, I think, depending on who the next next president is. Um, but I will say, you know, fundamentally, with the exception of some outliers, it's a bipartisan view to actually encourage innovation in defense. And so Ensign's mission, you know, our mission remains unchanged no matter who wins. Um, we are still going to be creating networks, strong networks to solve difficult national security problems. Um, and that's going to happen uh, whichever way the election goes. Um, I think, um, yeah, certainly, certainly a multivariate answer, but our mission remains unchanged. Yeah. So, so Jake, you have brought a lot of uh, uh, energy and expertise to, to your uh, very demanding job. Uh, in the time that you've had, what, what lessons have you learned uh, that you would want to apply as you move ahead? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I think um, the first lesson and the, like the most interesting thing that jumps out to me, so there's two. One's about the St. Louis ecosystem uh, and one is about DOD customers. And so seeing, I guess, seeing how um, the presence of the NGA here can catalyze a community um, is an important lesson to take forward because if there's a way that we can have a really extreme success here and then use the playbook that we developed um, to be successful in developing a geospatial economy, just like we did for healthcare and replicate it. I think it'll be a good lesson learned uh, to, to duplicate over um, to the next phase for, for whatever it is. Um, so, so that's certainly, certainly a big one. Um, yeah, I would say that's the biggest lesson learned for me. Uh, thank you for that. And, and so so the looking ahead, looking ahead to a year to maybe three years or even five years, I, I doubt if you even look ahead five years in, in, in this business, but uh, is there a strategic plan for Ensign? And, and uh, if there is, who who 
where's the input? Who, who actually establishes the, the uh, priorities or the, or the strategic goals for ENSIGN? And, and who do you have to engage with in terms of implementing that strategy? Yes, absolutely. So um, our managing director, Morgan Plummer, in collaboration with um, representatives on the Hill decide um, what are the most important um, what are the most important metrics that Ensign can deliver? Um, and so those conversations drive our top level strategy. Um, and, you know, things like, you know, what are the metrics we care about? Where do we need to expand to? Um, and what does the, what is the sort of face of Ensign look like on, on the map uh, and where we're going to be? And then it filters down through um, through leadership within Ensign, uh, through our portfolio directors and director of operations to decide tactically how do we implement those things. But I think from a high level uh, and strategic level, it's between, uh, between Congress and our managing director. And is there a perception now that we're on a path of success or are we still in an experimental stage? Or where are we in the evolution of, of uh, Ensign? Yes. So uh, fortunately, um, over the last year, I think we've gained a lot of momentum and, and sort of staying power um, within the government. So, so I think you're right that a lot of these offices that pop up will be sort of experimental. Um, but Ensign is a few years in now, and we've really, I think we've made our case clear by proving uh, success stories um, within the government uh, and engaging the private sector, um, that I think Ensign is certainly here to stay. And I am I'm uh, unbelievably excited to see where we are in five years, for sure. Now, uh, uh, Washington University obviously has a, a, a very significant engineering uh, 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 department with, with a lot of uh, innovative potential there. Are, are, you, are you working closely with the university so that the Ensign is known? Uh, in fact, all of us, I think, know Washington University very well. We're just learning about Ensign, and you're helping us a lot in that regard. But what about your relationship with uh, with WashU and what I suspect is some uh, significant uh, you know, uh, capabilities of, of, at the university in the medical yeah. area and you know, certainly in the engineering uh, area to uh, to uh, be involved in venture. In fact, I suspect they are. Uh, Ab absolutely. Um, yeah. So our partnership with McKelvey uh, is certainly deep, and Dean Bobick um, always talks about a a need for a deepened relationship between WashU and the department. Um, and so Ensign goes about facilitating that, facilitating that in a variety of ways. Um, one from a broad perspective, I think, is deepening the channel. Uh, uh, the relationship between NGA and WashU has been a big topic of conversation lately. Uh, and how can we infuse NGA priorities into the WashU curriculum? Uh, so that's kind of from a top level. And then again, some of the programs that I had mentioned where we're implementing project-based work uh, into the engineering school where groups of students and faculty are working on projects that are managed by DOD partners uh, and they're able to adopt solutions is another mechanism by which we do that. Uh, and then lastly, uh, these programs that I mentioned where we can facilitate tech technology transfer. So engineering PIs who have developed uh, the latest and greatest thing that applies to a defense customer uh, connecting them and building that relationship with the DOD customer and the folks at McKelvey um, and putting the channels in place so that this work doesn't just stay in the university, but it actually gets implemented with, uh, with the DOD and, and fielded. Okay. But again, the, the type of collaboration that you have uh, developed, uh, and this is something that we wouldn't have talked about 25, 30 years ago. It, it is is uh, it is uh, uh, the what Ensign does is it being integrated into curriculum and at, at Washington University or any university so that engineering students and medical students actually uh, uh, learn about what you're doing and the methodologies involved and and uh, so are they kind of codifying what you do in a way that can be taught? Yes, absolutely, and I would say the flagship program by which this occurs is Hacking for Defense. Um, so I mentioned that program, it was, it was started out at Stanford and what Hacking for Defense is, is an interdisciplinary course where we have DOD partners who come on as sponsors and they give, they give uh, these you know, teams of uh, business students and engineers problems that they're facing um, and they collaborate with them throughout the semester to uh, re-scope and re-understand the problem that they're attacking um, and, then, and then start to develop a solution for it. Um, we've seen a ton of success 
um, with Hacking for Defense. It's it's a it's a deep and, and thorough class, and it's a, a high lift for for students. But um, we've had just nothing but positive reports from from the class. The other way that we do it is through capstone courses uh, and independent research uh, venues. So um, if we find a project that's more of a dictated um, go from A to B technically we uh, by a customer, we can actually pull that into the capstones and research environment um, and give, give them a, something to work on, whether it's for a master's thesis or for a capstone course or independent study uh, or what have you. So those collaborations within the curriculum are, I think, super important for engaging the talent in the university. Okay. Let, let me uh, take a little bit off your subject, but I really uh, sort of engage your expertise on, 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 a, on a critical issue that I, I sort of touched on uh, superficially earlier in our conversation. But there is, uh, you know, um, in, in Congress, a great deal of concern now about uh, 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 China's students in, in our universities and how uh, technology may leak as a result of the, of the of espionage or cyber uh, capabilities of, of the Chinese. Uh, uh, being a lot older than you are, uh, Jim, Jim and I are, uh, are, are contemporaries in this sense. We remember back in the, Car uh, the Carter administration, which, uh, which is ancient history to you, but that's when the first Chinese students came to uh, uh, universities in the United States. So it was Deng Xiaoping uh, 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 proposed doing it, and Carter thought it was a great idea. The general attitude within uh, the U.S. government and the U.S. society, this is exciting that we are breaking uh, new ground and we're going to have uh, all the, the, these students uh, coming. Uh, it was it's seen, almost universally seen as a positive. Now there's there's a great deal of concern, but in the meantime, uh, in, in the period since the Carter administration to today, we've seen the globalization of the U.S. economy. We've seen a globaliz globalization of uh, uh, university education in the United States, and we've seen China grow from uh, from almost a third world status to it is now a number two economy in the world and extremely competitive and. Uh, you talked about areas like uh, uh, AI, or artificial intelligence. Uh, how, how, how should uh, someone with your uh, background, how should we be looking at the world in which, net, which now the, uh, the Defense Department is operating uh, with regard to that, 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 that globalization of the, of the university education? There's a real value to that, I suspect. I think most people on the university campuses would say that it, our, our research capabilities are better because we engage internationally uh, and, and that we actually have developed technology, not technologically because of that international engagement. So you are, you are not involved in international engagement, but you're an observer of it and certainly does intercept, I suspect, in your communications. But what, what is someone of your uh, considerable expertise and in our experience, how do you look at that, uh, that world uh, of uh, international engagement uh, on uh, s &T. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a, I think it's a big topic, um, but it kind of, I think it goes back to the point that we discussed before where um, the international engagement at, at university is something that is certainly cherished uh, and for, for very good reason uh, and, and international collaboration. And so um, I think at the end of the day, the best way that we can do it is um, to engage for, for all of its productivity while still um, maintaining safeguards that must be implemented to prevent things like um, IP theft and espionage in, in various forms. Um, I think it would be, you know, specifically in the academic communities, it's, um, it's, not, a, it's not a secret that there are, uh, I mean, there are foreign operatives at every top tier university that are carrying information back to their, to their home countries. And so, we need to be aware of that, but also not let it scare us out of participation completely. So uh, like many other things, I think it's just an important balance to strike um, and uh, certainly above my pay grade. <laughs> well, no, I, I don't think there is any pay grade with regard to this issue. As I say, the world has changed dramatically. We are now the beneficiaries of uh, international engagement, but how do we, how do we uh, bound a, a problem that, as you say, it, it, it involves espionage or or cyber uh, attacks on, on uh, our programs and platforms where, where we lose, uh, we, we lose uh, information. Uh, it, it's, it's a tough one, but I, it, uh, I threw it at you because I think your generation actually does have 
uh, a role to play in how we ought to get this resolved and now we're able to maintain valuable partnerships but also contain the threat that, that exists for uh, losing valuable technology in the process so yes. thanks very much i, I wanted to give you to, to sum up in any way you wanted to but uh, it, it really a terrific uh, presentation you gave and so generous with your time and, and the q a session also but we're uh, we're sort of closing in on the time when we it's time to uh to wrap it up, but I wanted to give you the last word, uh, particularly to the younger people uh, out there. Uh, nothing, you're not one of them, but uh, uh, advice, uh, career advice to people uh, getting into your field. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just to, uh, you know, to, if there are students, you know, at WashU or, or early career folks, I'm always happy to, or, or anyone really, I'm, I'm always happy to talk. Um, drop me a line. And I know we have some folks on the line who are um, not just from WashU, but from, from all over the place too. And so I'm looking forward to connecting those ecosystems um, with you all. And so uh, I'm sure there's a way to do that. And so just reach out. I'm, I'm happy to talk and, and discuss those sorts of things uh, anytime. But other than that, just thank you guys so much. Uh, really appreciated the time and, and, and the talk. And, and uh, thanks again. Well, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, we really do appreciate it. And uh, I want to thank all those who submitted questions and all, and, uh, all of you for engaging in what has been a very, a very uh, productive program. So thank you again, sir. And uh, I will turn it back to the managers of the program here.